Dr. Stephen Okeo. I'm an obstetrician and public health specialist by training. And uh, by practice, I do research, teach, and uh, provide service, clinical service as well. My interest here is basically because uh, of those roles. I am interested in the undertaking of research and the publication, uh, the undertaking of scientific work and the publication. And I'm a clinical microbiologist by profession. I'm told that uh, there is no formally trained clinical microbiologist around. That's why Aga Khan University recruited me. Before that, I used to be head of labs in Kenyatta National Hospital. I was faculty of the University of Nairobi I, in the medical microbiology department. My basic job is microbiology, diagnostic clinical microbiology. I do ward rounds, I do ICU rounds, I prescribe, I moderate prescriptions, and that is my job. Now, I prepared a very serious presentation, but for time, depending on your interest, I will scroll through some of them, recapitulate some of them, and then there are some discussion points. But actually, I expected, uh, according to the organizer, they were supposed to be 70 people of various cadres, so the presentation was prepared like that. So at your level, some of you may find this is just basic, but we have to capture everything. So I think I'll begin here. That's my hospital, Aga Khan University Hospital. And any university hospital institution is a temple of learning. It's a church or a uh, uh, mosque of learning. And that's the hospital. That's my laboratory where I work. That's my technologist working on TB cultures. This is food, chakula for the bacteria. That's where the culture media are prepared. I'm just sharing my, my core business with you. This is the safety cabinets. Big issue all over the country, biosafety, biosecurity. So these are the safety cabinets to protect the worker as well as to protect the samples. So I'm familiarizing you with, this is ICU in Aga Khan, and that is the annexure. This room is outside the patient room, inside is a patient room. In this room, the worker who enters, it could be a nurse, a physician, or a surgeon doing a round, or a visitor to visit his loved one inside. And those people wear their protective, personal protective gear. That is a gown, a mask, a cap, gloves, all those things are worn here before they enter the room. So this is a buffer zone, and this is a typical isolation room. The room has a negative pressure, and the air is exchanged according to the stipulated standards. If it is a TB patient, or it could be influenza patient, or could be coronavirus patient, you could have any time. So this room is prepared for that. It is certified by Joint Commission International. Even Kisumu Hospital, we are trying, Doc. And we are colleagues that way. I'm a faculty of Aga Khan, and you admit in Aga Khan. So I have the honor of becoming your colleague. I have no disclosures. I'm not being paid to do this presentation. So I have no conflicts of interest. If I show you my hospital, no conflict of, I'm advertising my university, no conflict of inter interest. I'm a teacher. We respect coronavirus. We pay our respects to this terrific pathogen. Spreading very fast. Okay. Quickly look at this. This is Africa Health Transformation Program, 2015 to 20. And this captures all around universal health care. We have rolled out universal health care in Kenya, isn't it? We have rolled it out. What exactly that it, does it mean to a patient, an ordinary Kenyan, in Siaya County Hospital, for example, or I, yesterday I was in Thika, patients cannot pay diagnostics. What we are practicing is witchcraft. If I am in the ICU, I have a seriously sick patient. I cannot do a blood culture because patient will have to pay. I was told yesterday, I was whole day, I was in Thika, 400 shillings per culture, patient cannot pay. So I'm the ICU intensivist, ID physician. Perhaps when you go for a round, there is no diagnostics. I cannot do blood culture. I don't have the liver function tests. I don't have 
uh, other renal function test, electrolytes, for example, how do I manage this patient? You are a trained physician. So if I manage this patient, am I doing evidence-based medicine or am I doing witchcraft? Am I the herbalist? Perhaps I am. And can we accuse a herbalist in this background? Perhaps no. So these are all the reflections as we dwell upon clinical trials. Clinical trial is the foundation for evidence-based medicine, gold standard. So if we don't have diagnostics and we have rolled out universal health care, are we really practicing evidence-based medicine or we are practicing some other parallel medicine? We look at it. So these are just glimpses. These are packets of antibiotics. When we prescribe, there is no rhyme or reason. There are no diagnostics and no capacity to maintain this. And the patient has been given instructions because he says, I can purchase only for one day. So just take two, as much money as you have. So the pharmacist will dispense. That is the truth, OK? More than 80 clinical trials are launched to test coronavirus treatments already. This is hot stuff, yeah? 80 clinical trials are going on for coronavirus treatment. This coronavirus just appeared in December. So how do you launch these clinical trials? Just think about it. How do you launch 80 clinical trials? So what is driving these clinical trials? Is it fear? Is it science? Is it money? These are big farmers. They have all thrown their hat in the ring. So think about it, yes. Answer is yes to all of them, yeah? We need management of these patients. We need interventions. So clinical trials are launched, 80 treatment modalities quickly. Okay, there is a push that the, the regulatory process is delaying, getting new drugs into the market. We need new drugs. So how do you do that? So there is a fast track mechanism of approving the drugs. So the clinical trial methodology, which we look at now, they take shortcuts. There is a methodology. It takes time. So there is a shortcut, fast track approvals. So India, it's 1.5 billion population. And they have clinical trials. They want medicines to come fast for local approval. So they have made these rules and regulations. Even FDA has now a fast track approval, like Ebola intervention. Patients are dying, and you have approval process. So there is a fast track shortcut. For that, also there is a methodology. How do you do this fast track approval? Now, all these gadgets we see in ICU, a patient has a cannula, uh, an IV cannula, an attachment here, an attachment here, electronic things, all those ECG, continuous mo monitoring, heart, lungs, all those things were approved by clinical trials. That's why I'm showing that picture. So clinical trial is not just drug. All those gadgets, all those things which are maintaining this person alive without allowing him to go to heaven is just like a vegetable. He could be a cabbage. He cannot speak. He, he doesn't recognize anything. But he's alive. How do we maintain him? This is modern medicine. And we maintain this life. And every pin and needle in that room is approved by a clinical trial. And the methodology will depend on what you are testing, what you are approving, which gadget. Is it a gadget, a drug, an intervention, whatever it is, it has to go through an approval process and a clinical trial, which we are going to see the methodology. OK, antimicrobial resistance, we call it AMR, is a global public health crisis. Now, we need more new antibiotics. One of the solutions is to get new antibiotics. So every new antibiotic somebody has to discover, has to go through the process, it has to be approved, and then there is a clinical trial. So now, the AMR is promoted by various things. Here they, they say, this particular paper, it says that some chemicals are promoting AMR. So there is a process to test this chemical. How is it promoting AMR? What is the intervention? Can we discover, look for an antidote to this particular chemical? So a scientist will go in that track. So that is, again, a process of approval and clinical trial. Look for a new drug, bring it to the market. So that is another interesting process. 
lot of confusion. How many people are involved? Who are the stakeholders? Who is low? Who is high? Who can fly? Who can't fly? Who's going to sink in the water? Stakeholders are a billion for clinical trials. And we will also look at that human integrity comes into play there when you have a huge number of stakeholders you can't control. Now this is a tip of iceberg. You see the hippo, you can only see the ears. Here you are able to see the eyes also, a little bit, but the huge body is inside the water. So the problem is very complex. Okay, we have licensed doctors. Not every doctor is a doctor. Not every surgeon is a surgeon. Bernard Shaw said, a surgeon is no more scientific than his tailor in cutting and stitching, as scientific as his dressmaker. That is just, just for, a, uh, for a diversion. This is what we should be covering if we had time. All these are the topics. When you discuss clinical trials, we should be covering in this fashion all these topics. But look at exactly what is clinical trial. Clinical trials are scientific investigations that examine and evaluate safety and efficacy of different therapies in human subjects. But we have also said the discussion is not limited to drugs. There are various definitions because there are various products which are being taken through clinical trials by various methodologies, including a fast track methodology. So the definitions will vary. Different individuals try to capture the essence of clinical trials in different times, so it is highly contextual. So you cannot have a single definition. Trials conducted in hospitals, we come to healthcare because that is our context. Commercial clinical trials, non-commercial trials, which are conducted by charities and other, you know, NGOs. Observational studies, medical device studies, which you have seen in that ICU patient, and drug studies. So you can break them into all these categories. When did we start actually clinical trials the way we do them? It goes, the credit goes to James Lind, 1714-1794. This James Lind is an interesting story. He was a Scottish physician and surgeon. Those days they, there was no distinction, surgery, medicine, all that, because everybody was practicing. They discovered things. They were practicing in all branches. So this James Lind went on a ship long journey and then those days scurvy was very common scurvy is vitamin c deficiency the patient starts bleeding from everywhere from the gums and teeth and it's a specific diagnosis today if i see a patient with scurvy i won't be able to diagnose because we have never seen how many of you have seen a case of scurvy we have never seen so maybe doctor if you see a typical scurvy you won't be able to you will send him to a hematologist this is a, some bleeding problem but it is a bleeding problem this particular gentleman with his brilliance made an observation that when the ship is sailing for two months, there is no fresh food. So the sailors are all coming down with the swelling of the gums and they start bleeding. And then once they reach the mild cases, once they reach, they start eating fresh food, they are okay. So he observed this for a long time and then he, he carried some lemons with him. And then he divided the sailors into two groups, the affected ones. One group, he was actually giving them lemons. You see, the guy who's flat, he's being given lemon, lemon juice directly into his mouth. So there are two groups. One is getting lemon, one group. The other group is not getting lemon. The group which, which is getting lemon, they recovered. And he could also see that you can prevent scurvy by giving lemon juice. The lemons are not fresh but they are concentrated vitamin C. So he made the theory that vitamin C deficiency is what is causing scurvy on the ship when there is no fresh green or fruit. So this is the first clinical trial, which this gentleman did. But today, if somebody does it, one group not giving, one group giving, the IRB will not pass it. They say this is unethical. You are leaving one group knowing that there is no intervention, they are going to die. Some of the medicines you know that they can protect, and then you don't give it to one group, you will, your trial will stop. You will not be given permission. But those were the days. And that was a discovery. That was not a clinical trial. It was a discovery. 
quickly, I think some of these things we scroll. There were other guys. This is a French gentleman. And he also did a clinical trial in 1986. This is current times. And this is an Italian physician who did also a clinical trial. And he defined some, some of the interventions. So what are the important things in a clinical trial? There is an experimental unit. For us, it's a human being, the population, the study population. So you bring a molecule for trial, hypertensive. So you, you recruit a cohort of hypertensives who already have high blood pressure. That is your experimental unit. Or you want to have a new treatment for diabetes, you have a cohort of known diabetics. They have been diabetic for 10 years. They are on some diet, exercise, this and that, but the blood sugar is not controlled. So you want to test a drug, a specific treatment. So that is your experimental unit. Treatment, the treatment is whatever you want to test. Maybe a drug, maybe a diet, maybe a program of exercise, any intervention. We don't have to call it treatment. Any intervention which is going to improve health is the treatment, evaluation of the treatment. Now the third element, how are you going to evaluate? Is it going to help? Is it going to not help, not have any impact? Or is it going to produce some adverse effects? So you have to check that. The whole thing is a clinical trial. I think I made it simple and clear. Experimental unit is usually a subject from a targeted population. I have already described this. Treatment intervention, these are the lists. I have not listed them, but all those things are there. I have shown you one picture in the ICU. One picture is equivalent to 1,000 words. So we can skip. Other examples, even surgical interventions, new tests, diagnostic tests, everything will fall under this. Currently, for cancer treatment, we have monoclonal antibodies. Even they are under this treatment. Evaluation, primary goal is actually to take the traditional evaluation, effectiveness and safety, two things. Is this treatment effective? In a diabetic, is it controlling sugar? In a hypertensive patient, is it bringing the blood pressure down? Is it bringing it marginally down or to the normal level? That is thing. And next one is safety. Is this intervention safe? As it brings the blood pressure down, is the patient safe or is he falling down, giddy or something? It brings it too low and then he drops. That is not our goal. So safety, effectiveness, both are our goals. The next one, you extend these things. You have given this intervention, you evaluate the other parameters. Quality of life, is the quality of life improved? Maybe you give an intervention like uh, the dialysis. There is a bag hanging here, the person cannot move, his, his quality of life is very poor. So do you need this intervention? Next one, pharmacogenetics. Is there a genetic modification by this intervention? Pharmacoeconomics. Is this treatment cost effective? Is, is there a cost benefit analysis? Like you use this much money, you are getting this much effective. So the economic evaluation, is it cost benefit competent? Are we going to get some, if it is programmatic approach, are we able to afford this particular treatment? Is public health able to afford a particular nation is able to afford this treatment. So that is cost effectiveness. All those things are elements of clinical trials which are modern methodology. These are again, the trials can be again clinically, you can look at them, treatment trials, prevention trials, when you are taking a vaccine through clinical trials, it is prevention clinical trial. Treatment trial, you are taking a drug. Close. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Quality of life trials, which is testing whether the patient is able to go back to work. What is the parameter when you test the quality of life? Is this patient, after you have given this intervention, like you put him on a dialysis, is he able to go back to work? Is he able to continue his normal life? So that is quality of life trials. Diagnostic trials, you bring a new diagnostic test. And then now you see the specificity of this test, sensitivity of the test, affordability of the test, and is it going to be a screening test or is it going to be ruling test? Ruling test is 
you do the test, if it is positive, you can confirm the diagnosis like this patient has TB. I can put him on treatment. Rule out test is a test which when it is negative, you rule out like this patient does not have hepatitis C, I don't want to put him on treatment. So are you able to use the test in all those parameters? So that is the diagnostic trials. Clinical trials are only conducted when you have met certain criteria on that particular intervention. If it is a drug, the drug has to meet certain primary criteria. We will look at them quickly. I think I will skip these slides and quickly explain to you what all those slides were saying. We look for new antibiotics. That's my field, so I can give you one example from my own field. We look for new antibiotics. Where are the antibiotics coming from? Where is penicillin? Penicillin is from molds. Streptomycin was from molds. Where are molds living? They live in the soil. So we go back to soil, look for new antibiotic molecules in the soil. So when we do this, modern methods, how do we do it? We don't do the way Alexander Fleming did it some 70, 80 years ago. What we do now, we go with what is called eye chip. And the eye chip has tiny compartments. And in the soil, you have say for example 100 organisms you cannot culture them in the lab in a lab like mine they don't grow so what do i do i take the soil where they are growing put them into this eye chip the soil itself and then add some other liquid media which i can make now in the chip each compartment is a tiny compartment the soil is there the organisms here are there and now they grow they grow in their own environment even then, out of 100 organisms, only 60 grow. The other 40 don't grow. So use another eye chip with another culture medium. So this is a long, tedious process scientists are going through, and they work throughout the day and night. There is no 9 to 5 job for them. They are there in the, in the lab. They eat there. They sleep there. They look for this growth. Is something growing? And then they extract what they are, the organisms are synthesizing and isolate the molecules and test each molecules for antibacterial activity. You have bacteria in your lab, put this molecule and then test, is it able to kill? And after 10 years, they hit upon one molecule. So all that goes in before you have that molecule which has antibacterial property. Now you bring it to the lab, to the animals. Test it on the animals. Can it cure the animal? With, with the challenge, and is it toxic to the animal? First on the rat, on hamsters, on guinea pigs, or rabbits, whichever is the animal, you choose and you do some animal trials. In vitro trials, and then you have that molecule. After that, now you start your clinical trial. I think we can skip this. Clinical research, again, I think we have seen this. Preventive, diagnostic, and treatment. There are three modalities. And this is just one example of how you design a clinical trial. You have one arm intervention, the other arm no intervention. And no intervention, you just observe. Okay? You just observe. The intervention is also called experimental design. So all clinical trials fall under experimental research. All clinical trials are clinical research. Right? And now, within the observational arm, there is a comparison group. You have groups which you are comparing. Like the, the mice which you have seen, you give your new molecule to one group of mice. There is another group of mice, you don't give the molecule. You challenge that group, say with the Staphylococcus aureus. You inject intraperitoneal. You inject to the intervention group, but you have treated them with your new molecule. Now, within the cohort which is not given intervention, there will be some mice dying. All of them don't die. They resist. So how many have died? You calculate. There is a statistics. Now, intervention, how many have died? And is there a statistical difference between the experiment and the observation group? And there is statistical methods, which I am not showing here, very elegant statistical methods, which are actually the purview of the experts, like clinical trial expert here. He is familiar with those statistics. 
And by the way, at this juncture, I should also share with you, Dr. Inos, all of us may not know, clinical trials has become a specialty in itself. There is a master's clinical trials, there is PhD clinical trials, PhD clinical clinical trials and experimental clinical trials, and he knows all those specialties. And people go and do five years PhD just on clinical trials methodology. And they have a whole one year training on statistics. How to use the statistical packages, the softwares, and all those is a different specialty. So doctor, he knows, maybe later you can have a chat with him. So this is the design and methodology. And these are the lists. These are just an example, but there are several other designs, depending on what is your product. If it is a gadget, you are testing like there is a skin patch. You put that patch here, and then later you have a small gadget, electronic gadget on your finger. You can monitor your blood sugar. Every 15 minutes or 10 minutes, you can monitor your blood sugar. There is a patch. So how do you? monitor this. How do you take it to clinical trials is a different methodology. It's not the same like when you bring an anti-diabetic drug. For the same diabetic patient, you bring a drug, it's a different methodology, but you are bringing this electronic monitor of blood glucose, it's a different methodology. So these are just examples of designs, study designs, but they don't cover everything. Parallel design, here you have similarly a control group and a test group, so we call it parallel because the study is parallel in two groups. And controls, there are controls. What is this control? You have a control group and you have an experimental group. The control is not having the intervention but is suffering having the disease or having some condition. Or it could be healthy control. So sometimes the control is called a placebo control when it is involving a drug. Placebo is like you are giving the drug to one group, you are just giving some sugar packets to the other group. Sugar or something, a candy, something, it's a placebo. And why are we giving placebo? Because we don't want among those people to know that somebody is getting drugs, somebody is not getting that. All of them get the same packet. It looks like the same. So that's a placebo. And no treatment is the scurvy group which we described long ago, there was no treatment. But usually these days, no treatment, they say, is unethical. It depends. So those are the issues. Placebo control has some advantages, some disadvantages. We could skip this. When should we use a placebo? When there is a minimum risk, short-term study, and in a disease which no prior drug has been established, like you have uh, a particular cancer, there is no drug. I'm just giving a hypothetical example. There's no drug at all. So now you have a new drug. You want to test the new drug. So you can divide your population, diagnosed population into two. One group gets the drug, other one doesn't get. Because there is no other drug. There's nothing unethical here. You are now trying the new drug. People who agree, yes, since I have no medicine at all for my condition, let me take the new medicine and let me check if I can be alive. So it is ethical, it is permitted, there is no drug. But supposing there is an old intervention, you stop that intervention is unethical. So you have to use that intervention, then also add the new intervention, and then check the statistical difference between the two groups. That is how the design and the methodology will go. I think we skip all these advantages, because I don't want to take, un there are uncontrolled trials where there are no controls, you have entire population, is deceased population. This is the run-in design and crossover design. This is interesting. This crossover design, you have two drugs. You start with two groups. One group is getting drug A, one group is getting drug B. And after some time, you stop. And there is a buffer zone. Later, you switch the groups. The group taking group drug A will now start taking B. The other group will switch to the other drug. So it has its own advantages. There are particular type of drugs. We do this crossover design. Prerequisites for crossover, I think we skip all that. Parallel crossover. Latin square design here, you are test firing three groups with three interventions. And it, it requires a very, very complex statistical analysis. 
let's skip all this. Two into two factorial design, incomplete factorial design, randomized withdrawal. I think we skip all this. This is a doctor level lecture. Yeah, he knows all this. <laughs> Maximum information design. Doc, you can copy this if you want later, if you are interested. I think we skip all this. Adaptive randomization, superiority, non-inferiority. Now, what are non-inferiority trials? All antibiotics go through this, non-inferiority. Like I have clarithromycin, which is for a non-tubercular mycobacteria specific therapy. Now, I have a new molecule I have isolated from the soil. I want to test, is it okay? So, we design the study, the clinical trial, in this non-inferiority design. That is, I have to show the new molecule is not inferior to clarithromycin, which is already the approved treatment for the patients. So what is the advantage here? Clarithromycin, some of the patients, I mean some of the bacteria, NTMs, develop resistance. So I need something which is equally efficacious, maybe not more efficacious. Those guys who can take clarithromycin, they can take, but when the bacteria are resistant to clarithromycin, I need an alternate. So if this new compound is not inferior to clarithromycin, it's fine. So I just want to dem demonstrate that it is not inferior to clarithromycin. It has equivalent activity. You get the point? So the design will depend on what you want to do with your new intervention. Like supposing you want a new central venous cannula you want to test. You want to design it that it is not inferior to what you are already using, right? And it is able to give some advantages. Challenges of design. Bias is a very serious problem in all clinical research. That is, you have your own assumptions, you are biased. You assume something and you want to show that. So bias is a very, very difficult thing in all clinical research. Most of the designs struggle around removing the bias. So the placebo which we said when you give when you are giving a drug but you also give a placebo like sugar powder or glucose powder is to remove the bias. Bias by the subjects, participants as well as the researcher. Both should not have bias. Randomization. Randomization can be done like this is the group. At random you want to give somebody the intervention, somebody the placebo. So you, you generate random numbers from the computer, or you can just take some, some slips, write the numbers, take a lucky dip, just pick five. Those five numbers will be given sugar. Other five will be given the drug. So that is totally randomization. The next process is blinding. Allocation, concealment, I think we skip all this. Blinding, what is blinding? Like I'm the researcher, I'm going and giving this intervention, I have these, these uh, subjects. I should not know who is getting sugar, who is getting the drug. Because I, maybe I want to show that the drug is very good. I'm already determined. This is my discovery. I want to sell it tomorrow. The patent. I want to get a billion dollar. So I want to show that it is working. So I should be blinded. I should not know who is getting sugar, who is getting the drug. Right? So blinding is very, very important to remove bias. So when we blind, the blinding is again different things. Blinded, the researcher is blinded. That is what the car cartoon is showing. Like, I don't know who is getting the drug. Then, the participants also don't know whether they are getting sugar or drug. It's double blinding. Right? The researcher is blinded. The participants are also blinded, which is called double blinding. Then, there is another triple blinding, is the data collector also will not know because all the patients will be de-identified. All their identities will be removed. So the one who is collecting the data, he also doesn't know. There is only one person somewhere who is not in the research group. Usually it is the pharmacist who prepares these packets, the sugar and the pills. So he knows, but he has no access to the data and he is not in the research team. It's a neutral person. So it's triple blinding. So blinding is to remove bias. So it's an important integral part of clinical trial methodology. 
reasons for blinding i think i have already explained single double triple there is another prospective randomized open with blinded end point assessment very complex thing and uses a different statistical package even i didn't understand what exactly it is unless you are involved in this particular clinical trial maybe doctor e will know double dummy technique see you are you are using a dummy you are using two intervention injectable and oral and then you switch one of them is a dummy you don't know whether the syringe is containing distilled water or saline or the pill is containing sugar there is a placebo it could be either in the syringe or it could be in the pill there is a placebo and it is a double dummy you don't know which one is so this particular one is used for vaccine trials when you are testing vaccines this particular design is actually very very useful application of various designs in phases of clinical trial i think we skip this but we should know what is phase 1 2 3 4 4 clinical trials we'll go quickly over these phase 1 i think to put it very simply phase 1 is the safety trial you just need 30 40 subjects like when we first made the the exemplar hiv aids vaccine it was just used in 30 40 people in kisumu just to say that when they take this there is no toxic effect these people are safe safety but already you have done rest of the stuff the animal the purification all those things you have already done now you are just checking the safety it needs 30 to 50 subjects that is phase 1 phase 1 clinical trial phase 2 you need more participants ideally 100 to 200 now you are also checking side effects efficacy part of the efficacy right is this able to protect is it able to produce the antibodies or you know titer of antibodies level of antibodies is it able to produce so now you check that that is phase 2 to put it in simple terms phase 3 is now you roll out you need some at least 3 4 5 000 persons and you have elegant statistical methods to demonstrate the efficacy and also the safety at the same time when you rolled it out to large number of people are they taking it how is the take of the vaccine and now here comes the cost effective analysis any other administrative issues like administering injectable oral acceptability in the community several parameters will be tested what is phase 4 phase 4 is you got approval you rolled out and now you do go and do monitoring in the huge population who are now getting this vaccine regularly in a program or this particular drug which is rolled out like like national program nhs in uk has rolled it out everybody is being given there are maybe 10000 people now you go and do field survey when they take all this what is happening to them this is long term it's several years so one example i can give you ciprofloxacin very very popular drug in kenya we eat it like jugu it's prescribed every day so much huh? for the spurious typhoid every fever is typhoid or malaria so you prescribe ciprofloxacin ciprofloxacin went through all these approvals it was approved and then it is rolled out after several years now the field trials are showing that it can produce irreversible severe neurotoxicity but in kenya luckily god protects us we have not seen that neurotoxicity i don't know i'm not aware of it lot of us are on ciprofloxacin we haven't seen that neurotoxicity now in us they have observed this neurotoxicity to the extent that the bayer who hold held the patent for a long time they were asked to put a warning on their packet now the cipro bay carries a warning about irreversible neurotoxicity produced by quinolone even on short term therapy which is frightful 5 to 10 days you think nothing will happen you you can stop the drug but it can produce irreversible neurological damage which is very serious so this particular thing you will not demonstrate in your phase 1 phase 2 phase 3 clinical trial it is only possible after you have rolled it out people have consumed for a long time and then you watch in the field so that is 
phase four clinical trial. And this is the hierarchy of evidence. How are we generating evidence? I don't know whether you are seeing these, these slides. This I described, taking an example of Tixobactin, soil bacteria, the, the, the compound, how do you isolate, that is the cartoon, going to origin, synthesizing or isolating that molecule, that is a drug discovery. These are the phases I have already described, phase one, two, three, four. Pharmacy plays a big role in clinical trials. I told you, the blinding process, the pharmacist manages. But they are actually investigators. Most of the drug trials, the pharmacist is either the principal investigator, he could be co-investigator, or he is part of the research team. He could be the manager, the, the clinical trial manager. I think that's your role, doctor, as an ID physician. Yeah, you are the PI, yeah, the manager. So these are all the difficulties when the pharmacy is managing these things. I think we can skip that. This also we have seen now. This is from uh, a website called Gapminder. Gapminder.com. Just go there. What is this? When you get a clinical trial data from a very elegant software package for a statistical analysis, you do what is called data viewing. Doctor, I think you are familiar with this. Data viewing. You put it on your software. I don't know which software you are using, but all of them are capable of this uh, miracle. You put in your data, you click, and you get a picture how to view the data. Now, this particular one is showing, actually it is showing the, the population in the coming years. It shows the economy on one column, the number of people, and the health. Infectious diseases, health, you know, you put all the data, then it is showing. So the biggest bubbles, the red bubbles are China and India, 1.5 billion population. What will happen to this population in coming years? That's what this data is trying to demonstrate. And then that side, the yellow green is USA. USA is something like 400 million or 600 million something. So from this, you project your data. So clinical trial data usually goes into this, this particular some some software but sometimes gap minder just put on the uh, uh, search uh, even on google gap minder small letters dot com and you will reach there you play around and you see but now when it comes to data unless somebody is well trained and well grounded this is, the cartoon is capturing that, data becomes unmanageable. Clinical trials usually generate a lot of data, lot of background noise, you call it. You are not able to hear the orchestra you want to hear, there is background noise. So usually clinical trial data can be very confusing. I myself, I am not an expert in that. I will have to depend on somebody to do it for us. And I think even Dr. E will say the same thing. There is a data manager who will do this and then allow him to do data visualization so that he can pick those things when he has to present to the donor, the one who is funding the clinical trial. He has to do maybe monthly or bi-monthly presentations. He will be helped by a data person. Otherwise, it goes like this. They, they have a supercomputer. Two scientists are looking at the data. Then they say, the computer is okay, but let's go and check with the pendulum. That is the scientist. Okay, I think the, uh, study documentation. When you launch any clinical study or even clinical trial, number one is ethical clearance. That is a process. We will not go into all those details. The ethical clearance is a process. There are national regulations, there are international regulations, like this clinical trial may be internationally guided, plus adapt to the national guidance, go through all that. And then, there will be stipulations of the international guideline which says you keep your documents in this particular way. It is a checklist. So you go through the checklist, keep your documentation in that fashion. There is a consent form which is by the donor, plus there is a consent form which is a Kenyan requirement. So you keep all those things for the auditor ready. So documentation is a biggest part and it's a whole department in a clinical trial. How to maintain these documents regularly, 
share with them and then meet the auditor and then discuss with the auditor. Regulatory documentations, I think I have already captured it. These are all the required documents before you launch your clinical trial. IRB approval, I think we'll quickly. <coughs> okay, now, in these slides what I want to say <coughs> is, evidence-based medicine is the mantra. Clinical trials are the foundation, gold standard for evidence-based medicine. That being the case, most of the clinical trials are conducted under regulated atmosphere, right? You have an inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria, you have a design, you double blind, triple blind, all the design, you select your participants and then you ro roll out the treatment, you use the elegant software and you do the data, okay. Now you approve the product, now the product comes to the clinic. When you are prescribing this product, Dr. is your patient meeting those standards? which were in the clinical trial? Is it possible to select patients with those standards? Evidence is only for efficacy, effectiveness, efficiency. All these, eh? efficacy, can it work? Hmm? Effectiveness, does it really work when I practice? Hmm? Does it really work? That is effective. Efficiency, is, is it worth it? If it is $1 million, there is that monochloral antibody for some particular leukemia, patient needs $1 million for one month treatment. Should we discuss it anymore? Because we don't have that kind of money, nobody can afford. So those are the things a clinical trial will consider. But this is the clinical trial. It has protocols, we have seen all that for the past one hour almost, eh? all those requirements. Recruit, do this, do that, all those. But in a clinic, Say, for example, in Kisumu, if you are in, in a clinic, in the CIA County Hospital, where I go regularly, you are sitting in the clinic, do you have all these criteria? We started with that. If I'm in ICU in Tika, patient can't afford culture. The lab cannot do culture. They, they don't have blood culture bottles because the cash flow is not there. And then for two months, they have no supply of some of the reagents. They have closed the tests. Ceftriaxone is not available for the past one month. And the med soup was with me. He says, I can't do anything. I don't have the money to purchase. So you approve your product with all those elegant clinical trials. Doctor, he has a protocol from US, I'm sure, right? The protocol is from US. And the product will be approved and now you are in the CIA County Hospital. Is, the, is it applicable, this knowledge, to that patient? We have to think about it very seriously. Okay, the level of evidence, sometimes they say the recommendation is very strong, but the level of evidence is very poor. In clinical trial, that's how they express. What is it, does it mean? Level of evidence is clinical trial. Do you have randomized controlled clinical trial to back up your product or intervention? That is level of evidence. If you didn't do, clinical trial, evidence is zero, but recommendation is very strong. So this is an example everybody takes. You are familiar with this in clinical trials. This is a parachute and people are jumping from that, that particular aeroplane because they, the pilot says now the engine is failing, huh? we will crash, so let us jump. Everybody gets a parachute. So at that time, the recommendation to jump with a parachute is very strong. Why? We know that parachute will protect you. You will land safely. Only it has to open. If it doesn't open, you can break your legs. It has to open and you will land safely. Strong recommendation backed up by human wisdom, human experience that with a parachute, you will reach safely. Now, what is the evidence? Was there a double-blinded, controlled clinical trial? On the parachuters? No. So level of evidence is zero. But will you use the intervention or not? Will you take the parachute or not because there is no evidence? So in medicine, this is what we have to, as we discuss clinical trials, we should not lose sight of this. So what is evidence? What is the strength of evidence? And what is recommendation? And the recommendation 
they say expert opinion is very low level. Doctor is aware, eh? all of you are aware. They say expert opinion because who is expert? Your expert is not my expert. My expert is not your expert. So expert opinion is very low level evidence. But here, to save life, it's the expert. The pilot is telling you this plane is going to crash. I've lost control of this engine. Please take these parachutes, open them and jump. Strong recommendation to save life. Level of evidence, zero. So this we should very, very carefully think about. These are all the references I have used. Quickly, I cannot close this without talking about fraud. Why? All clinical trials, Dr. The, your clinical trial is a billion dollar from the donor. Yes, one billion dollars. So when money is involved, human integrity comes into play. Yes, all are human and money is attractive. It spoils and actually it spoils the mind of the one who is in control of that money. So fraud in clinical research is a big topic and there is a lot you can read about it. Quickly I will show some examples. <laughs> What is this fraud? Cheating, misconduct, questionable methods, data torturing, data dredging, selective reporting, selective non-reporting. There are toxic effects, but the PI doesn't report. He will remove those documents. Huh? Patient, like in Cipro, that is what happened. Ciprofloxacin neurotoxicity was removed. The data was removed from the clinical trials until we detected it in phase four. Nobody knew about it. Ignorance, that is unintentional. People may not have knowledge, that is okay, but it will kill somebody. Is it okay? I'm ignorant, I don't know, but I go and stab somebody. That's not allowed. So all these levels of fraud cannot be allowed. So these are some examples. What are the motivations for fraud? I think we have already looked at them. Those are the motivations. Money gain, compensate for laziness, obtain a desired result, include subjects who would otherwise be excluded. So in clinical trials, you, you recruit patients who shouldn't be recruited. That's a fraud. You know it. Because you want to close your trial within the deadline, you just recruit everybody. That is fraud. So fraud in breast cancer study. This is the biggest institution in US. It was a huge fraud. And these are published every day in US. Yeah? Fraud in clinical research is, is makes headlines. And in this particular uh, research, it was top professors who were involved and they had to go and give testimony. It was very bad for the institution. So that is fraud in research. Like we cannot close without that. Difficulties of getting at the truth. A paper was published in a British medical journal about a particular intervention working wonders in some hospital in India. There is a surgeon. And uh, the surgeon got it published and its famous headlines. Then somebody suddenly wanted to check the data. So they went there, some, some officers in ICMR, Indian Council of Medical Research. So they went and they audited the data. And they found terrible things. All the data was cooked up. Whereas British Medical Journal published it because they, they, it never struck them that all this data is cooked up. Until ICMR warned them and then people started writing letters and they had to withdraw that particular research. So this is big fraud. Now, this is internet uh, era. You have softwares. You can use a software to diagnose a condition. You feed all the symptoms right? on your mobile. You can download the app. Pediatric online. You download the app and you put pneumonia. This is UTI. Like that. So this doctor has that software and the patient is there. He says, my, my software is telling you are pregnant. So, this is possible. This is quite possible. You could recruit patients on a software. It's happening all over US. They, there is the machine doing everything. And then they are recruiting patients with a, with a machine screen. And things can go seriously wrong. Now, where should we go with these clinical trials? I think down the line, five to 10 years, the clinical trial methodology which we talked about is going to be closed. Because now we realize that the methods are not working for us. One example is statins. Statins have been prescribed, approved by these methods. They have been prescribed for millions and millions of population all over the globe. Now we are being told that they don't work. 
So why were people prescribing and people were consuming? Why was that? It's the story of emperor's new clothes. The emperor is naked. Nobody says that he's naked. They admire his clothes. Until a small child shouted that this emperor is naked. So now somebody blew the whistle, statins don't work. So those methods have to improve. So now we are going for single, individual, individualized medicine and these are called time for one person trial. What is one person trial? Conventional trials, you have big number of recruits and you do some specified tests according to the protocol. In one person trial, you have very limited people like diabetics or hypertensives, you study them in detail. Their genetics, their liver function, their renal function and all their hormonal condition. And then when you do the intervention, how is his system reacting? And follow this person over a long time on the intervention. What is happening? By that method, we would have definitely discovered that ciprofloxacin produces neurotoxicity. Isn't it? It doesn't produce in everybody. It produces in only some people who have the genetic predisposition. So we could have discovered that particular one. And statins, we would have known that they don't work if that kind of trial was done. Detailed, prolonged study on small number of people. This is called personalized medicine. That is, one measurement doesn't fit all. The perfect suit is made to your measurement. So a treatment or an intervention should be, again, a custom-made, perfect suit made to your measurement. It cannot be a ready-made, uh, small size, Excel size, medium size, and you just grab it and you put it, okay, it works. But a perfect suit is custom-made. It's The tailor takes your measurements and he stitches for you. Medicine is going that way now. I think, ideally, quickly to share with you, these are top class universities in USA. Cancer patients on follow-up in the clinics, in the university hospitals, walk across the university gate and go to a herbalist. Because all remedies put together, some cancer patients, it's a warrant for them. So they go and try the herbal medicine, Indian medicine, Chinese medicine, uh, Greek medicine, and uh, acupuncture, there is also what is called touch therapy, Reiki. And I believe the top universities in the US, they are all engaged in research, clinical trials with Reiki. They are taking these alternate medicine through the clinical trial and approving them. And lot of yoga techniques, the Indian exercise, yogic techniques, are going through clinical trials to get them approved as a remedy for hypertension, diabetes, depression, various conditions, metabolic as well as endocrine conditions. And they say once the PI takes it through the clinical trial, he says that this method works. So what is the result? This has gone on for now 15, 20 years. The neem leaf extract has gone through clinical trials and they have now a patented antiviral. Don't accuse the herbalist if he's using neem leaves, he's using it, it's approved medicine. Perhaps the patent will be given to U.S. I think they already have the patent. I don't know. I didn't follow that. But USA, every state now, is opening a center called Integrated Alternative Medicine. And those centers are named Advanced Medicine, Centers of Advanced Medicine. And they have these alternate approaches. And most of the approaches may not be the conventional drugs which have gone through clinical trials. Some of them have not gone through clinical trials, but patients are ready to try. So I'll show you quickly some examples, which are the universities. This is University of Arizona. Intestinal malabsorption. The children are being treated with alternative approaches. And it is called Institute for Complementary Alternative Medicine. Complementary Alternative Medicine. And I think this is the Arizona website. They are the pioneers of alternative medicine. And most of these medicines have not gone through clinical trials. They are not really approved by clinical trials, but patients are ready to try them because they are fed up 
with the uh, AMS and a, you know those those approvals, the insurance, and lot of in Arizona, lot of elderly citizens don't have medical coverage. They are very poor. They have to choose between lunch and medicine. So those people go to these centers because they offer also very low cost, sometimes free approaches to health problems. So I think I should leave you there. Hand washing. For coronavirus, we can only currently do hand washing because we, we are not yet capable of testing on large scale. We only pray that we don't get infected. I think Kenyans are immune. Let us hope Kenyans are immune because we don't have so much infections. We have had direct flights from the epicenter of the outbreak, isn't it? Four direct KQ flights from Mombasa, four from Nairobi. I think Kenyans are immune. Let's pray that <laughs> we don't get. But wash your hands all the time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Let's uh, give a big hand to <laughs> Professor again. When she was younger, she was my lecturer in microbiology, University of Nairobi. Thank you. So, uh, Asante Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah. It was very hard, but I, uh, So, we now have entered the session for question and answer. We want, uh, after that, um, exciting talk. Kenya Medical Association and East African Medical Journal are trying to encourage scholarship in uh, because that's the bottom line for doctors. Uh, over and above all the other issues of welfare that we have done, we are encouraging uh, scholarship. The more doctors write, do research, that's their core business and that's their, uh, so to speak, their purpose in life. The only reason you are a doctor is to be able to improve society by conducting research, treating people. And therefore, we want to welcome a few questions uh, f uh, from the audience. And uh, uh, Professor here may take some. Maybe we can take five questions in a row, uh, circulate the mic. And then uh, once all the questions are in, she can uh, summarize. Uh, circulate, start with the clinical trial expert there. His experience. Participating. Okay. And is this relevant? Uh, um, th first of all, um, thank, thank you so much for this fantastic presentation. I, I mean, when I listened to it, I, especially when you went through some of the challenges, uh, especially with clinical practice and, and actually running a clinical trial in your uh, place of practice, I completely agree with you. I think from uh, my very limited uh, experience currently running uh, two clinical trials, I must say, um, it's, it's complicated business. It's, it's completely complicated. First of all, when it comes to issues of the regulatory approvals, I, I completely agree when you talked about um, issues of delays with regulatory approvals. It takes quite some time, especially for some of us who um, the protocols, we are not the ones who develop the protocols. The protocols come from pharma, uh, probably in the U.S., uh, approved by a medical center. Then, uh, for my experience, for Fountain, we work mostly as part of um, a multi-center multi -center trials, and we mostly work on phase three, uh, phase three trials where we try to recruit as many patients as possible. For our case, currently, um, I am, uh, I've just finished uh, a clinical trial uh, where we were trying to compare um, uh, two for those who, are, who, who have some uh, um, knowledge of HIV, they know that we use uh, TDF plus uh, FTC plus dolutegravir. So one of the trials that we did is we used a pro-drug of tenofovir, that is tenofovir alafenamide uh, plus uh, emtricitabine plus, DTG, plus dolutegravir. We were comparing the two therapies, first of all, to look at um, reduction in viral load. Um, uh, whether, they were, whether they were similar and we proved uh, non-inferiority, what you just mentioned. Um, some of the challenges that we faced, first of all, were issues of um, recruitment. 
getting that actual approved by the regulatory board because when it's approved outside, it also, we also have to make sure that the protocol is customized to be approved locally. Um, that alone takes probably about another six months. And so that also causes a lot of delays um, in, enrolling, in enrolling patients. The second thing is issues of um, uh, signing the documents as a, as a principal investigator. For us, as a principal investigator, you are supposed to fill in a form, uh, the 1572 form from the FDA, uh, which you have, to, you have to fill, where the PI takes full responsibility for, the, for, the, for making sure that you conduct that uh, study in line with the protocol, making sure that you meet all the inclusion criteria. But of course, when it comes to issues of adverse effects of therapy, the pharmaceutical company in, uh, indemnifies you. So you do not take responsibility for adverse effects for therapy that you are administering um, on behalf of a pharmaceutical company. But in case you deviate from the protocol and that patient develops certain issues, the principal investigator takes responsibility. So that one alone also takes a lot of um, uh, regulatory, those are some of the regulatory issues uh, that also come in. Um, apart from that, uh, issues of uh, fraud, we make sure as much as possible that uh, I pass. Yeah, yeah, the data collectors. So one of the things is that uh, for myself, I make sure that every week we confirm the whatever that has been entered. This when it comes to issues of lab, the labs issues. If you've done electrocardiograms on that patient, you have to make sure that all those patients, whatever you're seeing on the hard copy, is also what you're seeing on what has been entered on the electronic case report form that goes uh, to the pharmaceutical company. So that when the monitors come in, when the monitors come in, they normally sample a few just to make sure that you really stuck to the inclusion criteria. Um, I think for some of us, we are very lucky that we, I work with a very dedicated clinical trial coordinators. So, so far we've not had any issues uh, with, uh, with regards to, to data entry. But suffice to say that, uh, yeah, it's, it's complicated business. Anyone who wants to, to venture into clinical trials has to be very well trained, has to have some basic understanding of statistics. That should not scare you. Normally, sometimes it's statistics. You may not know everything. Uh, we are lucky enough to work with a few biostatisticians, but you must have the knowledge of really when you look at yeah, understand what you're seeing. Uh, if you're seeing data that is veering off from the normal, what does it mean to you? Uh, especially the figures. It, with issues of modeling and uh, calculating, that one we leave to the biostatisticians. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Paul Yonga. Um. <clears throat> okay. Yes, Professor Okeo. Yes, I... <clears throat> I wanted, I have a couple of comments and questions. I don't know whether I should put them all together or, uh, first, first of all, uh, Prof, I want to, you did not disappoint. And I'm sure you often get this accolade, sometimes in better words, uh, because for certain I have learned uh, more than something new. Um, and I want to start by requesting you, because of your expertise, to join our panel of reviewers, specifically for clinical research, if you don't mind. We will send you an official invitation. Uh, thank you so much. And number two is I was actually amazed when you said that they are already, between December and now, it's hardly two months, that are, there are already 80 clinical trials. And my belief is that a clinical trial process is a lengthy and a tedious and complex one. <laughs> and uh, so how, uh, over two months, did these 80 clinical trials go through that jungle of uh, clinical trial process? And if shortcuts were taken, uh, what is the implication for that? Uh, number two, if you could just elaborate a little bit about non-inferiority design. Because by the time you decide that it is non-inferior, 
you will have to have put it on trial. <laughs> but I understood that uh, you are doing a trial to confirm that it's non-inferior. Uh, and maybe I misunderstood that part. Uh, number three, if you could just say something about stepped wedge, uh, what is it called? Uh, step wedge cluster uh, clinical trial. And I know this approach is, uh, has, is gaining favor increasingly in my literature review because it addresses some of those legal issues of denying uh, uh, intervention to some groups. So if you could just, uh, without taking too much, just, just elaborate a little bit uh, what you know about the step wedge cluster randomized clinical trial. Um, issue of conflict of interest. Clinical trials are expensive, no doubt. Somebody has to put money in it. And once money is in there, I don't know how you can rule out conflict of interest. So is there a threshold of conflict of interest? Um, because they say there is nothing for nothing, uh, uh, including <laughs> this scientific work that we do. And finally, uh, you talked about the one person, personalized clinical trial. Um, I want to go away from this meeting with a little bit of uh, reassurance that it is a path that is worth considering, even if you don't start walking it, but it is worth considering. And I'm going to give you an example. There is an intervention of the market, it's called for life factor intervention is some form of immunotherapy that is being uh, stated to improve, improve health um, and well-being. And it is based on how this factor influences the immune, immune system. I have gone through literature, there's an ample amount of literature, but from interested parties. I'm yet if uh, I'm yet to see, you know, a proper clinical trial in the way that you described it. Thank you. Now, I want to respond. What was the first question? <laughs> because there's, there was a big list. <laughs> Actually, I wanted to say that one question, you answered another question that will be easy. I remember, number one, we start with the last one. One person clinical trial is actually being applied in the state of California for some new uh, molecules they want to bring. Uh, most of them, I, I think, are in the area of metabolic uh, diseases. There is no antibiotic so far because I keep following antibiotics. So there's no antibiotic. Uh, it is not likely that antibiotics will be taken through that kind of clinical trial. But most of the metabolic interventions are actually being done as a one-person clinical trial. So that is about that. Okay. The other one you said is, uh, what was the other one? Conflict of interest, uh, threshold conflict of conflict of interest. Of interest. In a clinical trial, in relation to clinical trial, as we said, several things are highly contextual. The, this particular con conflict of interest is customized to each clinical trial. And it will have the federal approval uh, elements. And it's almost like, a, almost like a checklist where you are, you are checking those things. And it says, are you government employee, not government employee, uh, NGO affiliation, family member affiliation. So there are specific customized elements and you simply have to follow that. There is nothing allowed, no waivers around that. So it's very, very specific. The other question you asked is about the cluster randomized clinical trials where you increase the intervention, add intervention stepwise. Now that particular design is useful for cocktails of medicines because single compound is not having clinical activity. Like example is anti-tubercular treatment. Anti-tubercular treatment since time immemorial has been a cocktail of three or four compounds. 
and when you start the patient intensive therapy is four compounds then you scale down slowly after two months three months whatever there's various protocols now and total four compounds are involved so how do you adjudicate which compound is is having the most effic efficacy which one is adding to the efficacy and within antibiotics are also metabolic drugs there is what is called additive effect and synergistic effect additive effect is simply 1 plus 1 is 2 so you have added one antibiotic second antibiotic 1 plus 1 is 2 that is additive effect synergy is 1 plus 1 becomes 20 that is multiplied 20 times so between these four compounds which two have additive which other two have synergy and when you combine what is happening so you cannot judge this in one phase so you have various clusters and you have given them various combinations there was one slide on that it's it's a checkerboard with various permutations and combinations so cluster randomized randomization works that way it's a very complicated design and recruiting patients this doctor he knows is a very complex thing who meet all the criteria and then to meet the checklist so it takes a long time to get a small sample and you have a sample size and also your time limit because the funder does not want to extend the duration of the trial. So it's very complex design. So I, I don't claim to be an expert, but I only know the outlines like you, you said, I only know the outlines unless somebody is involved, even he may not be expert unless he's closely involved one of those trials. So I think those are three, the other questions, I don't know what else you asked. Yes, yes, very important for coronavirus. For coronavirus, all these 89 applications, they will be entertained on one criteria. One criteria because for coronavirus so far, there is no treatment, right? So if you divide your, your population into treatment arm, no treatment arm, there is no ethical issue because there is no existing treatment. There is no antiviral. So that way it is very simple. But whatever new compound, it's a monoclonal antibody or it is a glycolipid or it is a, it's an extract from the soil, whichever agent it is, is it safe? So the phase one is very important. Whoever is applying has to show evidence of phase one, that this molecule is safe. Some 40, 50 people have swallowed it or got it injected and they are okay. They are walking, talking and they are safe. Nothing has happened to them. That is a prerequisite. The safety, non-toxic nature of whatever compound, whether it is parenteral or enteral, or you are applying it on the skin, the route of administration, safety for that route of administration has to be filed when they file this particular application. Rest of the stuff is going to be simplified because patients are dying, 2000, every day 100 patients are dying. You need an intervention fast, so if it is safe, and you show that some people got protection by some statistical analysis, it will be approved and you try. And then it will be still under observation. Like Ebola vaccine is still under observation, but it has been approved. Let us try because there is no vaccine. Non-inferiority was your other question. Non-inferiority, I think I already explained. You have an antibiotic which is working, but some population will not be treated because of resistance. So you want another agent to treat the same condition. So you divide your population into one arm which is being treated with the existing compound, another arm which will be now treated with the new compound. And if they are both equal statistic characteristics are met, this compound works, it is not less powerful than the existing one, non-inferior, it is okay. Most of the antibiotics are approved on non-inferiority trial. Thank you. I hope I have answered all your questions. Yeah. And I need to uh, beg to leave this I, meeting now I, I because I have closing. received several messages. Yes, yes. I was and actually we are, closing the meeting. We wanted yeah. to give you a vote of thanks, Professor. Yes, yes, yes. The yes. meeting was actually you. supposed to run between Thank 9 you. and 11. Thank you. We are 45 minutes behind schedule. We give her a big clap.
and uh, this is the first of a series of clinical trial meetings and we'll invite you for more. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Some food there, you can uh, eat a bit more. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.